Before we get started in our study this evening, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to be spiritually prepared for study this evening. Then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we are indeed grateful that we can come to you in times of difficulty, times of crisis, in times when we face uh, things that are far beyond our ability to handle on our own, that we can put our lives in your hands. We can cast our care upon you because you care for us. And Father, we are indeed grateful and thankful that uh, Cliff Beveridge's house and the church did not um, get burned up in this fire. We also pray for Rick and Amy in their house. We pray for their safety. We pray for their house, that they, that will not come in the path of the fire. Father, we also pray for others who are facing uh, tremendous challenges as uh, they face the loss of home, and we pray that those believers who are around them will be able to encourage them, strengthen them, and help to uh, minister to them, them during this time of need. We know that there are many, probably several folks in this congregation who have homes or family who have homes in the affected areas. Father, we pray for this state. We pray for the weather pattern. We pray that it would change and that we would have rain um, and that that would change, uh, change soon. We are in desperate need of rain. And Father, we pray too for Jim Myers and Jim and Phyllis over in Ukraine. We pray for their uh, circumstance with this visa law change and the uncertainty, and we pray that you would enable them to find out what they need to do uh, soon and that all of these red tape issues would quickly be resolved so that they can focus on, on the ministry. Now, Father, we pray for this time that we have together to, in your word that you would strengthen us, encourage us by what we study this evening. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, in our study in Acts, we've come to that episode in Acts chapter 4 when Peter and John have been told by the Sanhedrin that they are not to uh, heal or proclaim the gospel or teach in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their response was that should the question, should they obey God or man? And of course, the answer is they should obey God. This raises a question that I've been addressing the last three or four lessons in terms of what do we do, how do we determine the parameters for legitimately disobeying authority? Scripture teaches that God has set several layers of authority over us. There's authority within the home, authority within the marriage, there's authority in, in the workplace, there's authority in the classroom, there's authority in the military. Everything in life, every endeavor in life, involves some sort of authority. And all of this goes back to the way God designed things. There's even authority in the Trinity. There's authority in the Godhead. I started to address this some last time. And I think I got a little sidetracked as I was talking about some, some other aspects of this. But I was talking about the fact that within the Trinity itself, there is authority. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit share the same essence. The Trinity speaks of one God, a unity. And the word that is used in Hebrew in the Old Testament to describe the unity of God, as we have in the passage that is known as the Shema in Hebrew, Deuteronomy 6.4, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That word translated one there is the word echad, which is the same word that is used of when a man and a woman come together and are one flesh. So it is a word that doesn't mean a singularity, but a unity. And there is a, another form of that word, uh, in Hebrew that emphasizes a singularity aspect. But there are a number of times in, in the uh, Hebrew scriptures where you have, have echad speaking of, for example, one people. It's a unity that has within it a multiplicity. And so when we speak of God as being one, he is one in terms of a unity. There is one and only one God but that God exists with three persons. Now that seems odd to people who are not Christians. It seems different. It's one of those doctrines you have to take by faith uh, when you're young and you're a new believer. 
But as you grow and mature and begin to study the doctrine of the Trinity in Scripture, it becomes clear for a number of reasons, and I've gone into this in detail in other studies, that it is a, it's, it's a necessity. And it answers a number of different questions. One I was focusing on last time having to do with the, just the issue of authority versus tyranny is that if you have authority as it functions within a trinity, you don't have a tyrannical authority as you do in a solitary or unit, uh, unitary monotheism such as in Islam. In Islam, you go back before the creation of the universe and Allah sits back there in eternity past all by himself. He's all alone. He's eternally all alone. So there is no concept of an eternal relationship or a God who can be eternally a loving God. The word love is never used in the Quran with reference to Allah. Allah is not a God of love. This is, works itself out within, Islamic, uh, with, within the is, Islamic religion in the way they view authority. Authority is, t- tends to be tyrannical. Authority in the home is not an authority where there is a mutual equality plus a role distinction. It is simply the male who is the dictator within the home and the wife is somewhere... Uh, down the pecking order somewhere below the goats and the sheep. And there's a reason for that. They can only have a vertical flow of authority, which is not precisely the way it's presented in Scripture. In Scripture, you do have authority and a um, the one who is in the leader. For example, within the Trinity, you have the Father, who is the leader, and the Son can do nothing unless the Father allows it, but it is not based on the fact that the Son has less of a nature or is somehow unequal in his being or his person to the Father. So that the Father is fully God, the Son is fully God, there's nothing that makes up the uh, essence of the Father, the and the person of the Father that is lacking in the Son. The Son has nothing that is lacking in the Father. They are equal in every aspect, but nevertheless, God, there is the recognition that within a multiple, within a multiplicity of persons, there must be one in authority and one who is designated as the, as it were, to use a modern phrase, a project manager one who gets the job, sees that the job gets accomplished, and then someone who is delegated with certain responsibilities in getting the job done. And so within the Godhead, within the Christian concept of the Trinity, you have an understanding that authority isn't something that gets created by God to somehow handle sin or the problems of sin, or it's somehow related to the creation, but it is something that is inherent to the essential structure of God himself, so that authority is a good thing in and of itself because it's part of the Godhead, it's part of the operation, the social operation, we might say, of the three persons of the Trinity. There is an eternal society within the Trinity, so that in eternity past, the Christian God has an eternal object of love, so that God the Father eternally loves God the Son. God the Son eternally loves God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit eternally loves God the Father and God the Son. So that there is no need for them to create an object for love. In singular or Unitarian monotheism, which is what you have in Islam, Allah becomes, if, if Allah were to be an inherently loving God, it, he would be dependent on his creatures, which by definition makes him something less than God. I, you can't be God if you're dependent on your creatures. And in a solitary monotheism, if the God, if the deity is love, then he has to create creatures in, because he needs someone on whom to sh- uh, demonstrate his, upon whom to demonstrate his love. And so this creates a problem. So it's a It's an internal contradiction to have a singular or Unitarian monotheism, whereas within within Christianity you have a Trinitarian monotheism, and you have a oneness in 
unity and in, in, in plurality in the, in the deity. So we're looking at this issue of authority, and I also went through several examples uh, last time in the, old, in the Old Testament related to situations where you have a believer who is told by a legitimate authority, government authority, to do something, and the something that they are told to do is in direct violation of something that God told them not to do. So whenever an authority commands the believer to do something that God has prohibited or commands them to not do something God has mandated, then that is, seems to be the only time the individual believer is justified in violating a human authority. We looked last time at the situation with the Egyptian midwives, I mean the, the Hebrew midwives under the Pharaoh in Egypt in, in uh, the first chapter of Exodus. Today what I want to do is look at another example, three examples if we can, I can get through them tonight, in Daniel. Daniel is a crucial book for understanding a number of different things. And most people, many people rather, think of Daniel as a prophecy. Think of Daniel as a prophet because of so many key passages within Daniel that do speak of future events. Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, 10, 11, 12. The last half of Daniel focuses on prophecies that will be fulfilled in the future. Some of those were fulfilled in the period between the closing of the Old Testament canon, approximately 400 B.C., and the coming of Christ in the first century. But most of those prophecies have yet to be fulfilled. We know that the prophecies that weren't fulfilled will be fulfilled with the and that they will be fulfilled with the same precision as the prophecies that have already been fulfilled. That's the purpose of, of prophets who give a near, near prophecies, validates their position as a prophet, and then it shows that the pattern that if everything they said comes to pass in the precise detail that they said it would, then that which hasn't yet been fulfilled must also come to pass to the same degree of precision that the fulfilled prophecy uh, came to pass. And so that's the second half of the book. But the first half of the book has a different function. In the Hebrew canon, in the Hebrew uh, scripture, the Tanakh, the, and that's an acronym, T-N-K, for the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, Torah stands for the law, which means, Torah means instruction or guidance. That's the first five books of Moses. Then the second division is the uh, Nevi'im, the prophets, divided into the former prophets and the latter prophets. And then the third division is the Ketuvim, or the writings. Now the second division, the prophets, these were all books written by prophets who had not only the spiritual gift of prophecy, but they functioned within the theocracy of Israel as a prophet. Men like uh, uh, Samuel, men like um, Nathan and Gad, who uh, wrote later on, probably contribute to the books of uh, what we call First and Second Kings. Uh, you had other books written by a man who had the gift of prophecy, but did not, was not, did not have the role of prophet, and that was in Psalms. But Psalms isn't in the category of the book of the prophets, it's in the writings. So just as David had the gift of prophecy, but was not a prophet, so Daniel had the gift of prophecy, but was not a writing prophet. So Daniel was never placed within the category of, of the prophets. He is a, has the same gift of prophecy, as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Zechariah, Nahum, Jonah, any of those, but he didn't have that office or role within the theocracy. And this is important to understand because it, the, the rabbis, the, the Hebrew leaders, understood as they co were collecting the canon that Daniel, the purpose of Daniel, wasn't related to the announcement of coming judgment on Israel. Now that's something to, to think about a little bit to understand the role of the prophet. The role of the prophet was like a, uh, sort of like a prosecuting attorney 
who represented God to the people. When the people violated the Torah, then the role of the prophet was to alert them and confront them with their violation of the law and to warn them of judgment and to announce what the coming judgment would be. And so the former prophets and latter prophets have these themes of bringing and announcing judgment on the nation Israel, then later on the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. But in, throughout all their messages of judgment, they're also bringing a message of hope that there would be an eventual regathering of all the Jewish people back to the land and back to Israel and all of the promises that God had yet to fulfill to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and others would all be fulfilled at that time of that regathering, which has yet to take place. Daniel focuses on something different. Daniel focuses on God's, God's plan for the Gentiles during a time that is described by Jesus and Luke as the times of the Gentiles. This is why most of Daniel is written in Aramaic and not in Hebrew. Because the focal point of Daniel has to do with God's future plan for the judgment upon the Gentile nations as it relates to the future regathering of Israel. It is not a book that focuses on announcing God's judgment on, on Israel as much as it's focusing on how God is going to bring about uh, his future plan re to regather the nation. It's a wisdom book because it is designed to teach us how to live in a pagan culture. It's designed to teach us how to live in a pagan culture. Daniel and his friends are the focal point of several events in the first part of Daniel. And they have been taken by Nebuchadnezzar as hostages from the kingdom of Judah in, in Israel in 605 B.C., this is uh, almost just a little bit less than 20 years before uh, Nebuchadnezzar will come back in his third inv invasion and destroy the temple and destroy Jerusalem. And that was the beginning of what, was, of what has come to be called the diaspora and the scattering of the Jewish people uh, around the world. There's a partial regathering, but it's only partial after 70 years as some returned from Babylon, but you still had major Jewish communities scattered in Alexandria, Babylon, uh, Rome, Greece, and around the world. There's just a partial regathering at that particular time. So Daniel is written, part of the reason Daniel is written is at, to teach the Jewish people and to teach believers how they are to live and operate in a pagan environment, in an environment of opposition where their belief system runs counter to the belief system of the culture and the people around them, how they are to operate on the basis of wisdom. And wisdom in Scripture, wisdom in the Old Testament, is, is very different. Jewish wisdom is very different from Greek wisdom. Greek wisdom has to do with philosophical uh, and intellectual skill. But wisdom for the Hebrew was very practical. It was down to earth. It had to do with, with uh, practical living skills so that what you produced in life was something that was of value and it would have eternal value because you were living on the basis of God's word. It was the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. So chokhmah in in uh, scripture is this idea of skillful living. And that's really important to understand when we look at Daniel and Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, the Hebrew names of his three friends, these four young men have to make extremely mature decisions when they're operating under an authority that is virtual, in complete opposition to their core belief system. And so they, they can't react to everything that happens uh, that they disagree with. They have to decide how they're going to, uh, how, they're, how and where they're going to counter these mandates that are issued in rela uh, from the government because they are virtual uh, prisoners. There's no way for them to escape, no way for them to go home, and they have to do exactly what the king says. So they recognize the principle of authority, and they are not going to function in arrogance uh, in, in terms of rebellion. So let's look at the first episode, which occurs in the, is described in the first chapter. 
We're told something about the young man in, um, in the opening uh, two or three verses, a couple of verses. We find out from other passages that m- these young men that were taken in this first deportation were all of the royal family. So they were nieces, nephews, cousins to the royal Davidic line. And that would include Daniel. So they are of the aristocracy. We learn something of their parents and their families that they come from because these th- uh, four young men demonstrate a tremendous grasp of Torah. They understand the, the Old Testament, the scriptures as revealed at that point very well, and they're able to apply it with tremendous skill. So they are uh, unique in that way. Now, as they come, as we start, let me just read the first opening verses. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. Now, it's, that's an interesting reference to the land of Shinar, because it takes us all the way back to the first use of that term, back in Genesis chapter 11, when Nimrod uh, leads a rebellion against God, and he gathers his followers together at Babel on the plain of Shinar, and there they're going to build the Tower of Babel. So that Babylon in Scripture is first and foremost a literal historical city. But because of the, its founding, because of its history, it is used by Scripture writers as a picture of the highest and best that human viewpoint presents. It represents everything that man is in opposition to God. And so there's always this contrast in Scripture between Babel, the city of man, and Jerusalem, the city of God. And Babylon represents everything that man believes and supports and advocates in hostility to God. And so here you have these four young men who are taken as captives to Babylon. They are taken into the heart of the enemy's capital where they are going to be re-educated, where they are going to be brainwashed, where they are going to... uh, have every all of their ideas overturned and be retaught so that they can be uh, so that they can function effectively as bureaucrats and administrators within the government of of Babylon. And so that's a tremendous picture of how the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is living in the devil's world. We are surrounded by a hostile system of thought, which the New Testament describes as the cosmic system. There are various different manifestations of the cosmic system down through through the centuries because the cosmic system represents various philosophies and religions of man. So it always manifests itself in some form, but it always has certain characteristics. And the two foremost characteristics are arrogance and antagonism. Arrogance, because it emphasizes man as the center and basis of all thought, the the ultimate determiner of truth and right and wrong, and uh, antagonism to God, because all human viewpoint systems are inherently hostile to God, even though many of them seek to wrap themselves in the trappings of Christianity when there is a large presence of Christians there. It's not any different from... um, Various, other, various world religions such as Muslims, when Muslims are in culture and they're under about 2% of that culture, then they keep, their, they keep very low visibility. They don't necessarily dress the way uh, they, they would in a Muslim country. They want to blend in, get along, go along, and not create any, any kind of opposition until they reach a certain percentage within the culture. They get up around 6 or 7%, then they begin to uh, assert themselves, they begin to dress in a distinct manner, uh, and they begin to uh, push 
against the uh, culture that they're in in order to get it to change, to accept them more and more. And then as they move into higher and higher percentages, the ultimate goal based on Sharia law, based on the uh, Hadith and the Quran, is to completely subvert and take over, uh, take over the culture. That is all part of j jihad, which is something we should be thinking about this week as we're all going to be reminded to one degree or another about what took place on 9-11 10 years ago. And it was, uh, and we, there are, uh, uh, 10 years ago I remember predicting that probably within a de decade we would be uh, wanting to forget 9-11, we would want to minimize the role of Islam uh, in 9-11 and, so and the role of terrorism. And so you have these forces in our culture today that are doing exactly that. They are wanting to take the war terrorism vocabulary uh, out, of, uh, out of the public eye. They're wanting to uh, not talk about the fact that uh, all of the men that flew the planes into the towers on 9-11 uh, believed in Islam. They believed in a literal Islam. Now, the interesting thing is you get this cultural opposition that we have today to Christianity and to religion, and what it wants to do is use this term fundamentalism as a negative label to put on anybody who believes in a literal interpretation of their religious writings. So you have the, the Islamic fundamentalists, and so that term is used. Now you have the term, you've had the term Islamofascist and Islamist. All of it relates to Islamic fundamentals. What do they believe? They believe in a literal interpretation of the Quran. And the literal interpretation of the Quran teaches that their role is to take over the earth and they can lie, they can deceive, they can do whatever they want to. They show one face to those who are within the house of peace, those who are... Uh, Muslim, and they can show another face to those who are outside of, of the house, Dar es Salaam, the house of peace, and looking at the, those who are not Islam. They can lie, they're, they're justified, the end justifies the means to say and misrepresent and deceive those outside, the, outside of Islam, say anything they, they, they want to. That's literal fundamentalist Islam. Now people say, oh, well, you Christian fundamentalists want to do that. And today and in this coming year, uh, you're going to hear more and more writers in the uh, liberal press who are going to say, oh, look at these evangelicals, these dominionists. There's about 1% or less, probably less, probably less than half of 1% of all uh, evangelical Christians believe in some form of dominion theology trying to create some sort of theocracy on earth. And they're minimal Nobody pays attention to them. They're, they're just on the margins. Unfortunately, due to the fact that we've got some politicians who don't quite understand theology, who have allowed some of them to be in some positions of influence, that's given some ammunition to uh, those who are basically hostile to, to Christianity and to conservatives. So they're blowing this out, out of proportion. And uh, there was even... Uh, a book by Kevin Phillips that came out in the uh, first Bush administration called American Theocracy. He had three sections to the book. One had to do with oil business, one had to do with economics, and one had to do with how these terrible evangelicals wanted to establish a theocracy. Now, I'm not an expert in the oil business. We say all in Texas. I'm not an expert in the oil business, and I'm not an expert in economics. But I consider myself something of an expert in church history. And since he was quoting and saying things about people like Jerry Falwell and Tim LaHaye, Pat Robertson, I don't know, but I know LaHaye uh, well enough. I went to Greece with him, traveled with him, been involved with a pre-trib rapture study group. That's the last thing LaHaye wants to do. In fact, everything that the pre-trib rapture study group is for is to counter the influence of the dominionist reconstructionists. And yet you have these idiot liberals who don't know a thing about God or Christianity or theology who try to make any Christian a, a, a theocrat. It's just like 
It's kind of like the Romans as represented by Pontius Pilate. Jesus, are you a king? They're saying you're a king. Now, if you're a political king, you want to have a kingdom in this earth, then we're going to have a problem. And Jesus said, well, you know, my kingdom's not of this earth. Okay, fine. We don't have a problem. But because of the pressure from the Jewish religious leaders, Pontius eventually gave in, gave him a choice between Barabbas and Jesus, and they chose Jesus to get crucified, and Jesus was crucified. But, you know, it's the same issue, is that Christianity is not here to establish a kingdom of this earth. That is fundamentalist Christianity. And and fundamentalist Christianity says, love your enemies as as yourself. Fundamentalist Christianity says to turn the other cheek, which is actually an idiom for not taking offense easily. It's not a literal statement of turning the other cheek. I don't think there was a problem of people walking around slapping other people on the cheek in first century Judea. It's an idiom for uh, not easily taking offense at things, not being ready to react in anger when somebody says something you disagree with. Because our goal isn't to establish a Christian state. And no one within evangelicalism outside of this extremely irrelevant minority, uh, one of the most influential writers in that camp was a man named Rusus John Rushdie, and he has some very nice, interesting things to say in, in some aspects of his analysis of culture and the Mosaic Law. But as several writers have noted, all of those who have been influenced by Rushdie could be gathered together inside of a phone booth. He really hasn't had that broad of an influence, and neither has this whole Christian reconstruction, uh, reconstruction movement. So what you have today on, uh, among the liberals and the non-Christian is this pressure, and there's always this pressure. There was this pressure on David and, I mean, Daniel and his friends. There's this pressure on Christians to conform to the world's set of standards and the world's way of thinking. But just as God called out Israel for, to be a counterculture in the ancient world, God has called out Christians to be a counterculture in the world today. So there's always going to be opposition to what we're doing because it's opposition to God. Jesus said if they hated and persecuted him, we can expect that they would hate and persecute us as well. And so we're living in the devil's world. The devil's world is dominated by these two ideas, uh, arrogance and antagonism to God. We see that evident in in Babylon. Babylon is the picture in the scripture of all of this. So these guys are brought into Babylon, and they're going to be retrained. They're going to be re-educated completely. They're going to be brainwashed by the the best educators that the Babylonians have. And so they're put under the the, uh, leadership and control of Ashpenaz in verse 3, who's the chief eunuch. And it's his job to present them as as excellent civil servants operating under the authority of the Babylonian gods in, uh, in Babylon. Now, just as a side note, one of the things that you see in some of the friezes from, uh, uh, from Assyria is that when you see the king out on a hunt, for example, you see a frieze of the king on a lion hunt, there'll also be a smaller image nearby of the god on a lion hunt because what the king does is what it imitates what the god does and what the god does imitates what the king does and it's a way of expressing that the king is god that the state is god the state is the ultimate determiner of right and wrong and so this has to be inculcated within the these young men so in verse 4 we read uh, that they had they looked for these young men in whom there was no blemish but good looking There's always that emphasis on being attractive. People don't look past your attractiveness often to see the flaws. Men who are good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand. So they've got a high IQ, they're quick to learn, they're quick to put things together. And they have the ability to serve in the king's palace, which means they have to have a measure of of humility. They have to have authority orientation. You can't get anywhere in life without it. And you're not going to function in a bureaucracy or a hierarchy if you don't have humility. Whenever you work for somebody, uh, 
You need to be in a position where you are going to say yes sir, yes sir, three bags full whenever they make it clear that that's what you're going to do, even though you may not uh, agree with it. And you just have to learn to step around that. And this is one of the reasons that going into the military is such an excellent career choice or option for a lot of young men is they need to have a little enforced humility so that later in life those uh, lessons will pay off. So th these are p young men are picked because they already have humility. And so they're going to be taught the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. Now, there's an interesting connection between language and worldview. And I, I know this in observing people who are uh, bilingual or trilingual or multilingual, and that, that their personalities and their expressions will change completely when they shift from one language to another. And languages are often uh, developed, and there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship between the language and the belief systems of a culture. And so they're, they're going to be taught the new language, they're going to reflect uh, the thinking of the Chaldeans, and uh, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to come under, uh, under the category of the king's, the king's diet. Look at verse 5. And the king appointed for them a daily uh, provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank. Now, this would have been the best, just about the best available in the Chaldean Empire. The best food, the best quality food, the best cooking, the best preparation, and the best wine. Because it came from the king's, uh, king's own pantry. And so he's going to make sure that they are well-fed and well-nourished. And this would go on for a three-year training period so that at the end they might serve before the king. Now, that's, that's just kind of your summary introduction. Then in verse 6, we're going to zero in on these four young men. The writer says, Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. Now, there's a significance to this renaming. Their original names in Hebrew all had something to do with God and the worship of God. Uh, notice that at the end of Daniel and Mishael, you have that final prefix L, which indicates, uh, which is the generic term for God in Hebrew. The last syllable in Hananiah and Azariah is the first syllable in the proper name for God, Yahweh. So these are names that related to God's power, serving God, their dedication to God, and they're going to be renamed with names that reflect the gods of the, uh, of the Chaldeans. So we're told that um, Daniel is renamed Belteshazzar, Hananiah um, is renamed Shadrach, Mishael is renamed Meshach, and Azariah is renamed Abednego. And each of these names reflects something about the Babylonian, Babylonian gods. But they don't make an issue out of that. The, the boys accept that. They're, they're renamed. Verse 8, we're told, but Daniel, this is kind of an aside, but Daniel purposed in his heart, this is a volitional decision in his mind, that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies. He's not going to make an issue out of the fact that he's being renamed, but he is going to make an issue out of the dietary requirements. Now, is it, is it a theologically and culturally significant thing that these boys were named with names that honored uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yeah, that's, that's culturally important, it's theologically important, and it's an important aspect of their faith. But they're not making an issue out of that. The reason is there's no place in Scripture that says you have to have a name that honors God. You understand what I'm saying here? There's no place that says you have to have a name that, that if you're a believer in God, you have to have a name that reflects His name, El or Yah or something of that nature. That's great, that's wonderful, that's part of their expression of their faith. It's something that they 
felt was extremely important, but it's not a hill they're going to die on. You can't die on every hill. Now, I know some of you, there's no hill too small to die on, but um, we can't waste our energy like that. They recognize they can't fight that battle because there's no specific, direct mandate from God that you have that kind of a name if you're a believer. But there is specific mandates from God that they eat a certain way. In Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 3 through 20, there are specific statements and guidelines as to what the, the Jews were to eat and what they were not to eat. This is the foundation of a kosher menu. And they were not to eat uh, any number of things that were scavengers. A lot of people today will go back and say, oh, man, that was a healthy diet. Let's all go back and eat that diet. Well, it was healthy, but that's not why God gave it to them. He gave it to them to teach a principle, and that was that, that they were to avoid things that were, they were to avoid sin, and these, all these different creatures were creatures that fed off of dead things or somehow were related to that which had died. And so it was a teaching opportunity in relation to the fact that death is the penalty of sin. And when we get into the New Testament, and God reveals to Peter that all of these animals that have been, and all this food that has previously been declared unclean by the Mosaic law is now clean, it's not because all of a sudden they learned how to cook pork better. It's not because all of a sudden they learned how to deal with bacteria in certain kinds of crustaceans that might have been harmful to them. Because that wasn't the issue. The issue was that God was using certain categories of animals to teach something in the spiritual realm. And now that there was a shift from the Old Testament period to the New Testament period, Christ had died on the cross as the end of the law, then the dietary law was no longer necessary as a teaching tool, and so that was, that was, uh, that was removed. So Daniel recognizes that God has said, you are not to eat the, this kind of food. And so that's where he's going to plant his flag. That's where he's going to say uh, there's going to be an issue. It's not on something that's important, but it's not a direct command from God. So Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. The word there is a word that's related to being rendered uh, uh, ceremonially, ritually unclean. With the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank, therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now this is, pay attention to this, because you have a command from Nebuchadnezzar that you're going to eat the menu that I've provided for you. And Daniel's decided he's not going to obey the king. But he's making the decision to disobey the king on a point of direct, specific revelation of Scripture. Now, how does Daniel go about this? This is, shows the wisdom and the skill of Daniel. Today we live in a time when there's so much uh, fragmentation, polarization in our country, and among a lot of uh, a certain class of conservative Christians, I hear rumblings about, well, what do we do if uh, the federal government begins to intrude on our constitutional rights as guaranteed by the Bill of Rights? What do we do if the IRS comes in and says, says that, uh, oh, we're going to start taxing your church because you say things about, you, you say that homosexuality is a sin, or you teach that uh, uh, Christ is... Uh, Christ is God, or you teach that people are, who don't believe like you believe are going to go to uh, Lake Fire. This is hate speech. So how are we going to respond to that? And so I hear people, it's, some people can only think in terms of option A or option Z, and they ignore B through Y. David, is, I mean, Daniel is a master of the subtleties of B through Y. He's going to work skillfully. He's, he's, he's not going to say, you're going to tell me that I can't do this? Well, we're just going to round up the militia and we're going to come after you. That's not what Daniel does. Daniel thinks. He sits down and he says, we've got to come up with some, some, some skillful ways 
to use the law, to use the court system, to use the systems that are in place in order to reach the objective. And the objective is to honor God. The objective isn't to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar. And so he works out a strategy, and that strategy is to make a deal with the chief of the eunuchs. Now, verse 9 tells us that God's working behind the scenes. That's always important to commit whatever it is that we're doing to prayer, to let God be the one to change the hearts and the minds of people and be the one who works behind the scene, just as he did in the story of Esther uh, in dealing with Haman and working within the heart of Artaxerxes and uh, he recognized uh, Esther when Esther came into his presence, and then uh, through various uh, suggestions, he enforces a plan. Eventually, Haman is the one, the tables are turned on, and he's the one who ends up being, uh, being executed. So Daniel does the same kind of thing here. He, he goes to the chief eunuch. We're told in verse 9 that God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. It's the grace of God. God had demonstrated his grace. The word favor there indicates grace, goodwill to the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king. See, it would be his job. He's saying to Daniel, if I let you guys go with your diet and you're not as healthy as everybody else, it's my head that's going to be separated from my body following some serious torture. And I'm not sure I want to put myself on the line like that. And so he says, I fear the Lord my king who's appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. See, what matters to him is not the Torah. What matters to him is not the religious beliefs of these Jewish boys. What matters to him is keeping his head firmly attached to his shoulders. He's concerned with success. He doesn't care how he gets it. So Daniel recognizes this, and Daniel says uh, to hit the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over him. So now this is some time's gone by. He's formulated a plan. He's not going back to uh, Ashpenaz, the head of the eunuchs. He's going to the, the, the steward or the overseer that's been placed over him. And uh, he says, okay, let's work out a little deal here. Just test us. We're going to have a 10-day test. Hey, 10, we're going to go on a 10-day diet. Now, this, this precedes any of those 10, 10 pounds in 10-day diet kind of things you see today. And uh, Daniel says, we're, we're going to have a test. Let us, give us the vegetables to eat and the water to drink. We're going to eat kosher. And let everybody else eat the regular standard fare. And at the end of 10 days, you evaluate us, examine us, see how our health is, how do we look at the end of 10 days? Are we, gonna, are we slipping? Are we less attentive in class? Are we um, uh, looking wan and sickly or, or what? And so he makes a deal. And it's a short deal, so it's not going to get too bad in 10 days. And, he's, and he says, so then evaluate our appearance with the appearance of the young men who eat the king's delicacies, and then you make the decision. He's not confrontational. He is, and he's trusting in God. He's got a whole card, which is God, and so he's resting in God's promise. And he's willing to deal with whatever the consequences are. So the Steward consented with them, we're told, and tested them for 10 days. In the end of 10 days, verse 15, we're told, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Then the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And the conclusion at verse 17 is, for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So at the end of the days, when the king had said they should be brought in, uh, the chief of eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and he interviewed them, and none was like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were at the top of the class. Daniel was the valedictorian. One of the others was the salutatorian, and then whatever you have for the third and fourth were the other, were the other two. They were at the best because they're trusting in God. They're going to obey God no matter what, and they're going to take the consequences 
but they're willing to work within the system to present a, 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 an alternative to the plan. Now, this is, this is something that I understand from talking to, uh, to Charlie Clough after his 20 years of working inside of, of uh, government bureaucracy is something that he, he found that he constantly had to do whenever the bureaucrats would come down with inane policies that didn't work in the real world, and then they would have to come along and figure out ways to make the project happen, but work within the, the parameters set by, uh, by bureaucrats. And it calls for thought, it calls for intelligence, and it, you just can't have a head-on confrontation on every little thing. So let me just sort of summarize from this, um, from this chapter the lessons, that, um, the, lessons that we have, the lessons that we've learned here. First of all, the first lesson is that we have to choose our battle. You can't fight on every issue. You have to choose the critical, crucial battle. Because if you win the right battles, then the other secondary issues will eventually fall in line. So you can't waste your enemy, waste your resources on secondary issues. They didn't fight. They didn't make an issue out of being renamed. They made an issue out of something that was a direct challenge, a direct contradiction uh, to the Word of God. Remember, they're, they're assigned to go to classes. They're being taught all kinds of uh, fortune-telling divination techniques and necromancy and astrology, all of these kinds of things that are part of the curriculum in Babylon. But they're not, they're not raising their hand and saying, you're teaching evolution, I don't believe in it, I'm out of here. They're keeping their head down, they're learning the material, but they're not absorbing the material. And so they can become skillful within the context of the Babylonian culture without being... Uh, swayed and brought over into the Babylonian culture. And this has great application today because in many contexts, we are going to be working within corporations. You're going to be uh, teaching curricula in school. You're going to be a student in school, perhaps. And you have to learn how to uh, stay in a position of respect for authority in non-essentials, learn the material, but without necessarily being rebellious towards that authority and utilizing skill and wisdom in the process. The second thing we learned from this is that when a believer is going to oppose authority, it has to be on the platform of humility and respect for the, the, the authority position of the one they're opposing. You can't disrespect the position you may not have a lot of respect for the person in the position, but when you're, when you're showing disrespect to the person in the position, at the same time you're showing disrespect for the, uh, for the position. So we have to show respect for the person in position. We have to operate on humility. And we see in the conversation the way that uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach handle all the opposition in these chapters, that they do it in a, in a polite way winsome manner. They're not confrontational, but they do not yield their ground uh, either. A third thing that we notice here in terms of the wisdom is that Daniel is thinking about what the possible options are going to be. That if he appeals to do one thing, what happens if they say one way? What happens if he goes the other way? What, how is he going to make the moves? It's like a chess player. He's thinking three or four moves down the road. He's not just thinking, well, you want me to do this, and I don't think that's right, and I'm just going to tell you I'm not going to do it. He's thinking in terms of achieving the objective without creating a flare-up. So he's anticipating possible answers and future moves. Uh, that's the third thing. The fourth thing is that Daniel understands what his opponent wants. He's a great negotiator. He understands what the, the, uh, the, the Babylonian government wants out of them. And he's making a deal where he says, we'll give you what you want, but we're going to show we can give you that better if you do it our way than your way. Just give us a little test. So he's 
he understands the mentality of the opposing system so that he can use it against them. It's like cultural, uh, cultural martial arts where you're, you're using the energy of the opponent and redirecting it against them. So this takes a certain knowledge and thought and sophistication in terms of understanding the opponent's weaknesses. It's like uh, Sun Tzu said, you have to know your enemy. Fifth is that the explanation of the problem gives him an opportunity to witness. It gives them an opportunity to demonstrate that, that the diet of their God is superior to the diet of the Babylonian gods. It gives them an opportunity to show that if they do it according to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they will have greater success than if they do it according to the principles of the gods of the Babylonians. But they're not rubbing anybody's nose in it. They're not forcing that. If, if we look at the pattern that takes place here in Daniel chapter 1 with their training, in Daniel chapter 2 there's Daniel's, I mean Nebuchadnezzar's dream where he sees the, um, um, uh, sees the image and uh, uh, everyone coming to, to worship the image and the image represents different kingdoms in time and then the image is knocked down. Uh, it's only Daniel who's able to come and properly interpret tell him what the dream was, and interpret the dream. And the third chapter, which is the next episode we'll look at, when you have the episode with the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar builds this enormous uh, statue of himself that's 90 feet tall and uh, 9 feet around. And um, da Daniel, I mean, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the focus there, and they disobey the king. They're not going to bow down and worship to it, but they don't make an issue out of it. Uh, but each time, what happens is there's an increasing witness towards Nebuchadnezzar. After the episode with the, with the, when he sees the image, he begins to realize that the real controller of history is God. In Daniel chapter 3, uh, he sees that, that God is going to deliver his servants. And when he looks inside the fiery furnace, he sees uh, that, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have not been burned up. In fact, there's a fourth person in there that looks like the Son of God. Then when you get into Daniel chapter 4, Dan, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has this other dream, and this is the one that predicts that, that he will be insane for seven years. And at the end of that time, his sanity returns, and he recognizes that God is sovereign, and God is God, and he's not God, and he's not sovereign. And so I believe that Nebuchadnezzar becomes a believer at that point. He, he un recognizes and submits himself to the authority of God. And so all of this begins about 40 years earlier with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael, when they're 14 years old. And it takes 30 or 40 years to come to the end result with, Nebuch with Nebuchadnezzar. And so it's not, they're not looking for to, in a, to, in a instantaneous results in overturning the culture of opposition. So that's just a starting point. I was going to try to get through all three episodes in Daniel tonight, didn't do it, but we're set up. Next time we'll come back, and I think I can do the next two pretty quickly in, um, in one night. But the lesson we learn here is that when, we are dis, when an authority is demanding of us, obedience in something that is a direct violation of God's mandate, then direct confrontation and opposition isn't always the only option. We have to look for other ways through the utilization of prayer and dependence on, upon God's promises to turn the tables and to work within, within the system and not compromise uh, our core beliefs. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at this study this evening, to recognize that you are indeed the authority over all of human history, and that uh, obedience to you ultimately, ultimately leads to a life of blessing and a life of uh, happiness and meaning, even though uh, as we stand for you, there may be times that shorten people's lives because of persecution. 
Nevertheless, you are in control. And we're thankful we have a salvation that is based on faith alone in Christ alone, and that all of our sins paid for, and that we can just trust in you to provide the solution for the sin problem, and that you have provided that in Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.